Thank you much, uh, very much, uh, Judge Urbanski, for <clears throat> setting the stage for those important comments. So it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce the uh, speakers in the first session, and I'll, I'll do both brief introductions together before each one uh, comes up. Uh, <clears throat> so this will be the Law and Neuroscience uh, session, and we have two speakers, Dr. Reed Montague and Dr. Francis Shen. Uh, Dr. Montague will go first. He's based right here at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech Carilion. He's the Virginia Tech Carilion Vernon Mountcastle Research Professor, as well as the leader of our human neuroimaging lab, our computational psychiatry unit as well, which you'll hear a bit more about. Reed also directs our Institute's Center for Human Neuroscience Research, <clears throat> and he's a professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Physics. He's a globally recognized and celebrated leader in the development of experimental and computational analysis of how the brain uses information about rewards to inform our behaviors and make decisions, as well as a leader in the innovation of new technologies to query the living human brain <clears throat> during behavior and decision making. Reed has made major contributions to the development of powerful new approaches to understand the brain, such as the identification of what's called a prediction error reward signal, developing interactive functional brain imaging linking dyads and groups of people all over the world in an interactive network to study what goes on in brains as people are interacting and making decisions, and the recording of chemical signals with exquisite resolution in the brains of people undergoing medical interventions, giving us the world's first views of these critical processes as people make decisions. His work has been the launch platform for the bold new field of computational psychiatry, opening a window into the human mind with an unparalleled level, level of precision and objectivity. The next speaker will be Dr. Francis Shen. Dr. Shen is a Harvard-trained JD, PhD, who currently serves as the executive director of the Harvard Massachusetts General Center for the Law, Brain, and Behavior. He is also an associate professor of law, a McKnight Presidential Fellow, and neuroscience graduate faculty member at the University of Minnesota, where he runs the Neuro Law Laboratory. He's the executive director of education and outreach for the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on the Law and Neuroscience. He's been at the forefront of national initiatives at the intersection of neuroscience and the law, providing educational and training programs for the Federal Judicial Center, <clears throat> the American Bar Association, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Shen, amongst his numerous leadership and service roles, serves on the board of directors of the Center for Science and the Law and the board of scientific advisors of the National Courts and Science Institute. As both a lawyer and as a neuroscientist, Dr. Shen brings a unique and powerful perspective to the challenges of transcending these disciplines for the betterment of mankind. So we're very fortunate to have both these speakers and we'll open it up with uh, Dr. Reed Montague. Reed, welcome. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks for having me and I'm, uh, I'm personally quite encouraged to see everybody here. Um, can I just see a raise of hands? How many parole officers, parole system people are here, if any? Law enforcement people? Any brain? Okay. That's good. Okay. So I grew up in uh, Macon, Georgia. Some of you may know it. And I have to start with a metaphor, which is in Macon, Georgia, like Roanoke, Virginia, people are sort of outdoorsy. And one of the things you do as a kid in Macon is you skip rocks on lakes and creeks and rivers and things like that. And so by way of... Um, a Macon metaphor, um, this is what that is. This is a rock skipping tour of what do we mean by computation and cognition in humans? What is it that I can give you a promissory note over in terms of what do we know about the brain now? And let me give you one example of how people are decoding brain function in ways that I think are surprising. And then I'm going to end on a, another metaphor that points the way to the future. And I'm going to do all of that in um, 26 minutes plus uh, 3.2 minutes of questioning. So that's that's my task for today. This is the very brief introduction to cognitive neuroscience. OK, so we're going to start with the idea of computation equaling the idea of cognition. So by, by cognition, you might think of how do I perceive this thing I'm seeing? How do I take inputs from the world around me, use them, value them in some way, and make choices predicated on that? What goes on? Well, if you don't believe in magic, then very subtle mechanisms inside your head are mediating these things. How do we describe these mechanisms? Well, for the last 100 years, we've described these mechanisms in physical terms, meaning um, uh, uh, how do different 
protein receptors in your brain bind things? How do neurons in your brain maintain a battery across their membrane? How do they send signals to one another? This goes on and on and on across scales. That would be called biophysics and biochemistry and physiology and whatnot. But a new way of looking at all these processes has risen in the last 80 years, and it's called computation. Now, we, may, we hear about computers and stuff, but I'm going to be very clear about the sense in which I'm going to say computation and cognition are equivalent. Okay? Then I'm going to give you a little promissory note about neurons. That is, what do we know? We hear today that, oh, science doesn't really know anything about the brain. What do we really understand about it, et cetera? At one level, that's true. Where does our conscious awareness come from? How do we compile together in institutions like this? How do people operate in composites? Uh, how do different parts of our perception work, et cetera? In some of these cases, there are big gaps in our knowledge. We know a lot about nerve cells, though. We know a lot about neurons, all the way down to the molecules that compose them, et cetera. I can't even begin to give you a rock-skipping su summary of that. I'm just going to point to a few pertinent facts about it. But don't let anybody tell you we don't know a lot about that. We know an enormous amount. And all you have to do is go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting any year. This year, it's in Chicago. And listen to any one of the 45,000 abstracts that will be presented. And that's limited. Okay? That's how big it is. It's a, it's a gigantic enterprise. And we know an awful lot. What we don't know a lot about is how all those parts at these tiny scales that we're beginning to you know, pull apart atom by atom compile together to do things like make you enjoy ice cream the composite sort of system level work, okay? And then I'm gonna show you an example of how it is that we're using physical measures of the brain to decode brain responses that pertain to how you choose stuff that would have applications for addiction and how you come to certain kinds of abstract decisions. In the case I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you um, how you decide to vote. Okay, this is a picture of Alan Turing. Nobody would have known him. Uh, 15 years ago until the movie came out about his life. We're talking about decoding um, the German Enigma code during World War II. He was central to that process. He was also a mathematician who in the 1930s was at Princeton University doing his PhD before he was sucked into the war effort. And he came up and wrote a paper in 1939 called On Computable Numbers. And he made very clear what the idea of computation was. I won't go into that, that's kind of technical using old arguments from the 19th century. But he also came up with the idea of what it might mean to think. And what his idea was was this. So in, in the 1930s, he invented this notion of an abstract machine called a Turing machine, which is a tape that you could write ones and zeros on. You could have a head that erased and wrote these things down. And he showed that anything that you could call an algorithm, from a, following a recipe and a cookbook all the way down to how do you compute the trajectory of you know, the, uh, Apollo 11 to the moon, uh, could be cast in terms of what you call a computation, a finite state machine that changed one pattern of numbers into another pattern of numbers. And then he posited the idea that maybe the way we think is like that. Maybe we are like a computational theory of mind. That is, he distinguished between the patterns of information processing that we're interested in and the hardware that implements it. OK? OK, that seems sort of simple. I mean, we think of software and hardware is being distinct now. And the reason we do that is because that's built on his idea. Every machine that you have beside your desk and in your hand is called a Turing machine and not by accident. So what did he do? I mean, he solved basically, you know, what philosophers never solve, which is roughly everything they try to do, okay? He, he said, how do you get mind light -like stuff out of stuff-like stuff, right? And people puzzled over that for centuries. And the idea is that, well, that's the wrong way to put the question. The mind isn't like stuff in that sense. It's a set of relationships. And many different kinds of hardware may be able to implement something that's like a mind. So your mind is really kind of like a computer program. That is the computational theory of mind, that even though my brain is different than your brain and may be different than a mouse brain, there's a way to talk about the computations being implemented by the physical parts of these systems in which we can see them to be the same or at least related to one another. That is the way people like me frame what you would call cognitive science, OK? It wouldn't start in psychology. It would start down here with computation and reach its way up to psychology of decision making. Now, the fact is, to do anything about psychology, like the law, you can't wait until you know, nerdy people like me come along and give you the whole theory of the mind and the brain, OK? You can't wait for that. 
It's like medicine. You've got to do something tomorrow. Or the economy. Without a complete theory, you've got to do something tomorrow. You can't. You have to do something practical tomorrow. And they're normative parts of it. So the one thing I want you to take away from my talk is it isn't all about just the brain. The way you frame the question, I'm going to end on an example like this. The way you frame the question may change the way in which what we know about the brain answers it for you. Okay? So it's not just a science question. It's a normative question of how do you want to compose yourself and organize yourself. All right. That's computation in uh, three and a half minutes. Um, everybody that I work with is rolling over in their not yet graves. Okay, so that's the ambition. That's the ambition. We have an enormous body of cellular and molecular data from human brains. We have an ability to eavesdrop on working human brains safely now, not at scales that we wish. We wish that we were at smaller and faster scales. And we're trying to relate them through computations to behavior of moves and thoughts. So the, the shtick is get a model that accounts for the way a person, let's say, decides whether to eat ice cream or um, chocolate pudding, and figure out a way to, to compose that as a computational problem, and then go looking for things in your brain that look like that, that abstractly look like they're solving that problem for you. Those become candidates for the circuits in your brain that are, media or that are mediating that kind of valuation, okay, and that kind of decision-making process. That's the ambition. That's what people like me look to do. You look to connect the, the brain with behavior and thoughts. Let me draw your attention here. This is a kind of a complicated drawing, but it's an interesting one. Um, this is time on the x-axis here, and this is spatial scale on the y-axis. Let me draw your attention right here. So this would be your whole brain. So this would be on the scale of something that's about this big and weighs about three pounds. Okay. This is what's called a map in your brain, things that represent point-by-point -point structures in, on your body and in your visual system and whatnot. This is a collection of neurons. They would be at this scale. This, would be this is a single neuron here. It's about 10 millionths of a meter in diameter. Okay. And we go all the way down to the business end of the neuron, which is called a synapse. So neurons are like denuded bushes. I'm going to show you a picture of them in a second. And they make connections onto one another. And those connections are called synapses. And we know a lot about that. We know a lot about how those synaps synapses are formed and how synapses work and whatnot. And we know that synapses can, are adaptive and can learn. In fact, every scale in your nervous system that we've been able to look at shows adaptation, all the way up from single synapses to your composite decision-making behavior as a whole human being. And what you're seeing is the different kinds of techniques. I'm not going to go through and, and um, talk about them that are available to look at these different levels at space and time in your brain. Different techniques look at different spatial and temporal scales, but the main thing is they have a limited aperture. Any one way you ask the question physically is limited in the space and time. You use an electron microscope, you can only look at one level. This is the plot of what we had in 2014. This is the same plot in 1988. Okay? So one of the big things that's filled in here came about right here. And it's right here. It's called functional MRI imaging. Okay? And it's the thing I'm going to show you an example from today. It's using magnetic resonance imaging, which everybody has probably known about, which in the 80s was introduced clinically to look at um, water density differences in your body. So you can take a snapshot of your lung or your head or your knee or something like this and diagnose various kinds of things. In about 1989, it was discovered that that methodology could be used in a very different way to record microscopic blood flow changes in your brain. And your brain is an incredibly efficient device coupling the need for oxygen to the delivery of blood that delivers oxygen to it. And so by being able to record microscopic blood flow changes in that efficient structure, you had a proxy for neural activity changes. In other words, a way to read out a blood flow movie from 150,000 sites in your brain simultaneously gives you an indirect measure of the changes in neural activity that are going on, and we never touch you. You're just lying in a magnet. I'm sure a lot of people here have had an MR. You lie in the, in the tube of a superconducting magnet, and we wiggle magnetic fields around, and the water molecules in your brain give off radio waves, which you use to reconstruct where those tiny blood flow changes are going on. Okay, so you can do clinical things with that, but you can also do interesting things like um, think about a sailboat, or a kitty cat, or in, in the case that I'll show you here, uh, eat earthworms. Okay, so let me just finish my neural part um, three and a half minutes later. 
Um, this is a neuron. This is a, 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 a typical looking pyramidal neuron in the brain. So that's its cell body. The DNA is in this part right here. Okay. And it looks like a, a, a bush or a tree where you've stripped all the leaves off. These are called the dendrites. They receive inputs from other neurons. This is a, an expanded view of that. Here's a dendrite. They have these little knobby things on them called spines. And when synapses form, a presynaptic terminal, a, a terminal here from another neuron, this is coming from another neuron, makes this kind of slightly bulbed connection here called a synapse. Okay? And that's a highly sophisticated adaptive structure, like it's smart. It's about as sophisticated as a city, in my opinion. Um, and it adjusts itself. It's one of the basic loci of learning in your brain. It's one of the things that changes, that we know about that changes. And people that use animal models to study learning and addiction is a learning problem. We'll come back to that in a moment, at, the, at, at the end of my talk. Just to give you an example of what we're talking about in terms of the machine and whether or not we're close to simulating it on a silicon computer, we are not. Take these numbers, for example. In a cubic millimeter of cortex, a brain tissue, which is about the size of a match head, which is a better metaphor 30 years ago than it is now, um, about that big, uh, there are uh, one and a half to two billion synaptic connections of those things. And they're on the order of about two to three miles of dendrites of these structures here, and about a mile of axons, which is the main output pathway in which one neuron makes a connection on another. Okay. All of that wire is self-repairing and self-healing, okay? And that's just one little cubic um, millimeter. I mean, that's, that's a ridiculously adaptive, miniaturized device that knows how to fix itself continually. No amount of thinking goes into that. That's automatic, okay? We don't really understand how to represent that in a standard silicon-based machine, and I suspect we're going to have to discover new ways to build computing devices to really get at the details here. Those details will end up mattering. That doesn't mean we can't do anything now, but they will in the future end up mattering. Okay? And that's what the neurobiologists at places like this and other institutions are studying, and that's part, um, part and parcel of what those 45,000 abstracts in Chicago this year, the Society for Neuroscience, will be. Okay. Cool. We know a lot about neurons. We know a lot about synapses. I've just promised you that. This is basically a promissory note for that. Um, the problem is that we don't really know is, is a levels game here, okay? So we have biochemical networks inside cells and synapses. We have neuronal networks, which would be networks of neurons in your brain that form a sort of coherent entity and are connected to one another, but it's basically its own network inside your head. And then we have networks of networks and networks of networks on that. And then we have whole individuals, and then we have whole individuals interacting in groups and doing things as a group that they wouldn't be able to do or be willing to do as an individual. Those are a lot of scales to understand. We don't really understand if we're going to go after drug addiction. We don't understand. What we do understand about drug addiction is that it hits a table like this at many levels. So it hits you at levels of neurons that we know are responsible for getting sort of hijacked by drugs of abuse. These are dopamine neurons. And at the level of the decisions that you make and the way you organize yourself in a social context and on and on. Okay? It's a big problem. This is a functional magnetic resonance imaging device. You could use it to make clinical pictures um, of people's heads or knees or whatnot. And what I'm going to show you uh, in closing is one example of how we can put people in these machines, make 100,000 blood flow measurements, one measurement every second or so from 100,000 sites, while you do a perceptual task, and then take that information and decode something about you that you would think is quite abstract quite sort of human, quite sort of what constitutes the conscious you, and get a mapping onto that that's very, very predictive and not something that you consciously are aware of, okay? And it's this. So we're going to take people and we're going to stick them into one of these devices and we're going to show them a series of, now I'm explaining an experiment to you that we've done and published, a series of emotionally evocative visual stimuli taken from something called the International Effective Picture Systems, or IAPS. Okay? You can't show these pictures because they're part of a, a kind of sacrosanct database that you, no, nobody wants everybody to be polluted by these images so they can use them over and over again in research. The University of Florida keeps them. People like me register to have access to showing them. And I can't show you pictures from that database. I can show you pictures like it. Okay? And we're going to use that to decode basically your political ideology whether you're a conservative or a liberal, 
Okay? So you're going to look at a bunch. Now, when you do the experiment, you go into the scanner, and I just show you a bunch of pictures and say, look at the pictures for me. Okay? You're not told it's about anything. The pictures are a sailboat or a kitty or a, a, a dry leaves on the uh, positive to neutral side. And on the negative side, it's like a poopy toilet or flies on a salad or gross stuff. Okay? You know, e evocative stimuli across the spectrum of evocation. So, oh, okay. Uh, this is a technical slide. Uh, this is my colleague, uh, John Hibbing, um, who made this slide for, at the time, what was John Stewart's The Daily Show. And it's not proving that he likes worms. Uh, it was our image that matched one of the images from the database. So that's a gross image, in case you were wondering. It, it's actually a disgusting image. It's technically a disgusting image. Um, but that's what I mean, stuff like that. He's, looks, he looks like he needs, he's in trouble, right? He's a real troubled character here. Uh, he's actually a co-author on the paper. Um, so what we're going to do is this. You're going to go into this machine. We're going to show you these pictures. We're going to record your brain activity while you're watching these pictures with no other instructions loaded on board your mind. That's it. Look at the pictures. Pay attention. We track your eyes. We're going to then use what's called a machine learning method called the elastic net. It's a modern computational method um, that's now uh, used, for example, in perceptual recognition systems, systems that learn how to drive cars. Okay. <laughs> And we're going to ask it to map your brain responses during the viewing of these emotionally evocative images onto something called the Wilson Patterson Political Ideology Survey. Uh, John, in the last picture, is a political scientist, so he's the one that brought this to the mix. And it does something like this it basically puts you on a scale from what you would call a traditional conservative to a traditional liberal. It does not map onto party affiliation very well, at all, if at all. In other words, it's not a Republican slash Democrat, it's a traditional, let's call it traditional conservative to traditional um, liberal. And the part that we use was simply this part right here. And I don't have them all listed, there were 26. These are basically trigger terms for people. So if the IAPS pictures are visually evocative, these are semantically uh, uh, evocative. These are, these are issues that people have big reactions to, unless they're not people. Um, but that doesn't say anything about it. And there's a slider bar on the screen, I'm not showing you that, where you set, where you go from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Okay, so everybody sets this, they do this outside of the scanner, and we ask your brain, can we develop a mathematical mapping from your brain response to pictures that have nothing to do with political ideology onto what you score on that test to the degree that we can predict what you score on the test? And the answer is, uh, it, it's shockingly good. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to use this slide except to show you that anything you ask the nervous system, including a legal question or do you want to take a drug question, doesn't, never activates just one area. It activates networks of areas. So when people talk about what's the brain region responsible for addiction or responsible for that person's choices that made, there is no such thing. That's not how the brain works. The brain is a distributed network. Information is distributed amongst multiple sites redundantly represented in ways that we only vaguely understand for the problems that you guys are interested in. Okay, so that's the point here. You have networks of responses. These are brains. Here, uh, the blue indicate things that are uh, specifically responses for the group that ended up being uh, liberal, and the hot to scale here is for the conservatives. And you can see they don't overlap very much, but they're also not just in one place. That's the point. Here's another point. One, I could predict what your score on that test was with about a 98% accuracy, just looking at your brain response to these images that had nothing to do with school prayer, abortion rights, small government, and some of those terms there, right? Number one. Number two, I could, I could actually be at about 94% accurate with just one of the images taken from a, uh, a category of disgusting images. That's why I showed you the disgusting image before. It was the disgusting images that caused these two groups to separate as clearly as they do. But then when you go back in and ask people consciously to rate the pictures based on the way they scored on this test, and only the people that were congruent with their score, in other words, if they took the test and they ended up being a traditional conservative, we also asked them, do you feel like that's what you are? And as with these people here. 
and they rated the images, there are no difference in their rating of the disgusting images, the threatening images, and the pleasant stimuli across where they end up in this abstract category. So whatever it is that's driving their conscious report of how they feel, or what they're going to do, or what they want, or what they, quote, believe in, something in their brain betrays that, because they don't, they don't see it. Their, their consciousness doesn't see a difference between these things. Okay? So that's an example of how um, what goes on in your head may have information in it that betrays certain things that you're going to do that you don't have conscious access to. But what I've, that's only half the problem. What you consciously decide to do also has an impact back down on these systems. You know, thinking about something, perseverating on something, you can get addicted to certain patterns of thought, if you will. What drugs do is they go in and attack the same systems that are there to, for you to harvest food, sex, water, and salt to keep you alive. All right? Those systems can be subverted by literally anything in a human being. It's just drugs are very effective at that. I'm going to leave you with a thought about that, because one thing we do know is we know a lot about those systems in your head, one set of systems, the dopamine systems, these are, these are neurons in your brain stem that project to the rest of your brain. We know a lot about what they're trying to learn and why they get tricked by drugs of abuse. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with this following thought experiment. Okay, so here are things that we all know about, and we know people can get addicted to any of this stuff, including Krispy Kreme donuts, okay? Now, suppose I did the following experiment. At night, I'm gonna sneak into your room on random nights, you're not gonna know it, you're not gonna know I was there, I'm gonna inject you with heroin. Okay, we'll slip out. No, there's gonna be no residue with the fact that I was there or the fact that I injected you with heroin. I'm gonna come back at a random night later, I'm gonna inject you with heroin again. I'm gonna do that for several months, okay? At the end of several months, your physiology is profoundly dependent on those doses of opiate. It's profoundly dependent on them. If you don't get that dose of opiate, of course, you don't know that anything's happening to you, right? You don't know that anything's happening to you. If you don't get that dose of opiate, you start feeling terrible. You start sweating. You start having constipation. You'd have all these things of anybody withdrawing from heroin. Are you addicted to heroin? Okay, this is a question. So look, can I see the yeses? Yes. Okay, can I see the noes? Okay. You are not addicted to heroin. You know why you're not addicted to heroin? There is no cue in the world around you on which you reorganize your behavior. There's no idea that if I just went and got some heroin, these stomach cramps and this diarrhea and this, and this, uh, this feeling of sickness and nausea and whatnot would go away. You don't know that. As far as you know, nothing's been happening. You don't know what's happening to you. It's like I've made your insides an addict. The fact is, Addiction, in that sense, has to be hooked to something that causes you to reorganize your behavior. If you're not going to go spend your life savings putting white powder up your nose, it's really hard to call you an addict, even though you don't know that you require this little gremlin to sneak in your room every night. Okay? So there's a point there. That's a learning problem. right? If you don't provide it something on which to learn, then it doesn't have anything on which it can mediate the relief of these physiological symptoms. They, they just, you know, you'd probably chase around with doctors. Doctors have no idea. They would have no idea what was wrong with you. I'm gonna leave you with that. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much, Reed. We have time for just a brief question or two, if there are any at this point. but now just bring him to the stage, uh, Francis. Whoops. Welcome. Please join me in welcoming Professor Francis. Great. Um, well, thanks for uh, having me here. Thanks to Virginia Tech and Cynthia, uh, Vice President Conti, um, Judge Urbanski, Judge Ballou. Um, good to see you read uh, as well. I'm going to talk this morning, uh, this afternoon, about law and neuroscience. Um, and a lot like Dr. Montague, give you sort of a high-level overview of where things are uh, and invite your thoughts about where things might go. And I thought I'd start with this. So this is, if I were able to, if I were a little taller, <laughs> a lot taller, I'd get up and you'd see that um, that's a picture of my brain. Pretty good-looking skull, right? 
Uh, and that was taken off one of the machines that uh, Dr. Montague was talking about, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. And I start with that uh, for a couple of reasons. One, and the primary one, is that uh, we should ask the question of why someone on the law and why so many of you in law and criminal justice, not in medicine, should care about images uh, like this. Uh, the other reason is to say that I'm happy to put this image up, but I wouldn't put my social security number up because as precious as our brains are, the fact is that you, know, you could take this and you know, that image, I don't know how much you can, you can do with it, um, but the big question really is, is why. And for me, the big idea is that law should turn to any discipline, philosophy, English, history, economics, and by the way we do use economics all the time, and a whole bunch of other disciplines, if it can help us understand the animal that we care about in law. There are a whole bunch of animals on the planet. For the most part, law cares about the human animal, some other non-human animals as well. And neuroscience today offers us, along with its related disciplines, uh, of which there also are many, uh, machine learning and, and, and uh, genetics, genomics, etc., offers us a window into the re reasons that humans do the things they do, sometimes the reasons that we and others don't do the things we wish we would do or don't think the way we want to, and maybe we can harness that knowledge and do our jobs in law a little better. This gets to one of the fundamental tensions in law, which is the lawyers in the room will know we rely on precedent. For the non-lawyers, Here's the basic understanding of precedent. We believe that it's just in law in 2018 on identical facts to do what we did in 2017. We wouldn't want to just treat someone differently this year than we did someone last year. Same idea, what do we do in 2017? What we did in 2016. Indeed, we're bound, unless the Supreme Court changes it, to do in 2017 what we did in 2016 and on, on, on. And someone about a century ago, not just any someone, but Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, ushered in a movement called the Legal Realist Movement with this book, the Path of Law, 1897. And what he observed was that there's a, there's a problem here. If we have blind adherence to precedents, what if the world changes somewhere in, I don't know, the intervening century? And he said, it is revolting to have no better reason for a rule of law than it was so laid down at the time of Henry IV. And much of our, especially in criminal law doctrine, actually goes back to some assumptions we had about human behavior centuries ago. And he said, it's more revolting still if the grounds upon which that law has laid down have vanished long since. Almost all the slides that you just saw from Dr. Montague would not have existed even three uh, decades ago. Now some of the computational work to Turing would have at the beginning of the century, but certainly but not back to 1897 or back even centuries ago. And in law, unlike medicine, we still regularly cite cases and doctrine from centuries ago. And so this is one of the fundamental challenges. How does law adapt to new science and new technology? And as I'll suggest today, it's not always clear. This is not a training today. A training would be if you got a new electronic filing system or a new version of Microsoft Word, and you'd come in, probably begrudgingly, but you could walk out knowing exactly how to use that program, no questions asked. This is a dialogue, because there is no such exact, as you're going to hear, there are promising treatments, there are new modalities of, of engagement uh, with addicted populations, but there's not a magic treatment, right? So this isn't a training, this is a dialogue, and that's a challenge. And that's the work that we do in our lab. The motto of, of our lab is every story is a brain story, and the big challenge is that at present, every story is not a fully understood uh, brain story, especially as you get to these levels of, of engagement uh, and some of the higher order cognitive functions that we care about in law. I've got a bunch of students, we do about a bunch of outreach. I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I think these slides may be circulated, so I'll just put up two websites that may be of interest. One, uh, Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. It's a, a group up at Harvard. And there's a big bibliography of this work uh, at lawneuro.org. The last thing I'll say is that if you're really interested in this work and you think, boy, 20 minutes wasn't enough, uh, it probably isn't. And we do full long, actually day and a half programs. We've, these are two examples with the Federal Judicial Center. And we've had federal judges, and we also work with probation, parole, uh, pre-trial, will come in for a full day. So instead of the 20 minute version, we'll start with an hour and a half on the science build up. Think about things like memory, uh, decision making, uh, and you name it. So this is a little bit of what we do in the longer program. I just want to talk about the past, uh, the present, and the future, and we don't have time to go into the past. I just want to flag it to note that there is a history here of law and science generally, and specifically law and neuroscience, and it hasn't always been pretty. To give you an example, one of the questions that law has, and that sort of society cares a lot about is why do people do bad things to others? And in particular, why are sometimes people really violent with others? 
There's a big difference between getting cut off on your car on the commute home saying, I could kill that guy, and actually getting out of your car, taking your hands and strangling someone, or taking a gun and shooting someone. That is an experience that very, very few humans on this planet will have, and yet those in the justice system see those individuals every week. What's the difference in those brains? That's a question that has um, been of interest for a long time, and I just want to flag that there have been solutions proffered for a long time. Uh, these are just come examples of different books, but in 1933, I don't know if you can see that image well enough, that's a commemorative stamp of a device that won a Nobel Prize for the prefrontal lobotomy. Now, when I say the word lobotomy today, most of you appropriately say, well, that, that doesn't sound very uh, effective, but at the time, it won a Nobel Prize, and those in criminal justice, at least some of them thought it might be very useful. Psychosurgeon, I'll just give you one quote so that we can stay humble as we move forward. This is from the Yale Law Journal for the science and medical folks. This is like the equivalent of, you know, science or nature. This was a big deal. And it never went forward, but they thought about, boy, this could be really good. Here's the quote. Psychosurgery has startling implications for rehabilitation, and it is proving successful in an increasing number of cases. Perfection of so relatively simple and inexpensive a rehabilitative technique as the prefrontal lobotomy promises to be a major contribution to the cure of criminals. Right? And this is, again, another challenge for law. When we come to uh, facilities like this, medicine and science, we have to ask you on the expert side, is it ready? Is your treatment ready? And then we have to rely upon you and really our collective work to say it's ready uh, and ready for full-scale use. That was not ready. And again, just to keep us humble, um, Again, I think there's a great future in neuroscience and law, but it doesn't mean that every particular device or proffered um, intervention is a good one. All right, so what's happening right now? Well, as you probably know, if you just open your eyes, brain science is everywhere, from you know, European and US initiatives to covers of magazines, and also in just popular culture. I'm gonna show you a 30 second uh, video from a group called Lumosity. Uh, they target uh, all sorts of different folks for their, with their brain training games. And I'll have a comment after, but let's just take a look. I worked hard to retire early, but I didn't want my brain to retire too. I mean, I stay up. It's not the same. Science, and you're seeing this a lot. There's a regulatory challenge for those who are, who are regulators in the room. I'll just mention it. Again, the theme is excitement. It would be great if we had that sort of thing, but caution. And this particular group was hit with a big fine from the Federal Trade Commission because many of those claims, not in that specific ad, but in related uh, uh, documents, simply don't hold up yet. All right? And again, so we need to be excited, I think, about possibilities that neuroscience offers us but be cautious. All right, so let's go into the courts. That's what we're here for. Um, I could stand here today and give you rip from the headlines one after another, just from the last few months, but here's one that's made the rounds just in the last couple of days. This was from April 27th. Bra blame my brain, a killer's bold defense gets a court hearing. We're seeing lots of examples like this where a uh, defendant argues that because of some brain abnormality, this was a particular genetic uh, abnormality, either the court, if it's an insanity defense, should uh, let this person off the hook entirely, or at sentencing, they should have some sort of reduced or different sentence. I'll come back to the merits of those arguments, but this isn't a hypothetical, what if somebody brought brain science into the, into the courtroom? This is already happening. We've got data to show that it's happening more and more. This is a graph from our colleague Nita Farahani at Duke, and there's other data from other scholars showing the same trend. This is just uh, criminal cases and just um, in, at the appellate level, it undercaptures the number of cases. The point is that uh, from 2005 to 2012, and she's got new data continuing to today, there's been a steady increase in the number of these cases where judges and potentially jurors are introduced to brain evidence. Now, there is a bit of uh, misleading, uh, uh, this, is, this chart could be a little bit misleading because on the y-axis it only goes up to 350 cases. The denominator of all criminal cases is enormous. It's a tiny slice and it's really never been suggested by anyone that every criminal case is going to suddenly involve neuroscience. I think it's likely, and I've written this much, that neuroscientific evidence is likely to be like instant replay. If you're a basketball fan, you're following this because right now there's so much disagreement about whether the referees are doing their job or not and everybody wants to go back and look at the video. And in fact, 
we now routinely think about. If there's a big Virginia Tech game, when do we use instant replay? Actually, for about 95% of the plays, you don't use instant replay at all. You use it when the stakes are really high. Did he score a touchdown or not? When the foot is right on the line, when you disagree with the referee, and critically, when you actually have access to a video feed. Images like this, which are now routine in football, simply didn't exist 50 years ago. And images like this, the possibility of non-invasively looking at brain function were not possible up until a few decades ago. And I think it's likely uh, that we're going to see more of this, and that's driving a lot of those, those cases, high-profile important cases. There are more people writing about uh, this, and there are more students learning about it. And I want to commend uh, Virginia Tech. I had the, the great pleasure of teaching a law and neuroscience class uh, with uh, Dr. Sontheimer uh, to his neuroscience students two years ago. Um, and if you don't know, you have an entire school of neuroscience. And Dr. Sontheimer uh, has this wonderful phrase calling neuroscience the new English. And what he quote him all the time, and what, I mean, what he means by that is that most English majors don't major in English to become a poet laureate. They major in English because I think, I think what I want to do is going to require me to be able to read and write really carefully. And many neuroscience majors are going into neuroscience not because they want to do a PhD in neuroscience, but because the field that they want to pursue is going to involve a lot of human interaction. And they want to understand what's happening in the mind of these humans as they are involved in business, nursing, <laughs> law, social work. And the rise in the number of majors in, in the School of Neuroscience, I think, points to that. The other thing I want to mention in terms of this is our casebook that we've written, not to publicize the book, but to point out that the field is moving really rapidly. We've got this big 800-page book. Almost 90% of the material has just been published since 2000. We're working on the second edition. This stuff is moving really quickly. All right, so there's kind of the broad uh, you know, uh, uh, scales of what's happening. But what do these cases actually look like? Let me give you some illustrative examples. I'll focus mostly on criminal law, given the topic of the day. Though at the end, I'll note that there's a whole bunch of work on the civil side as well, all sorts of lawsuits uh, and some interesting questions. We'll focus mostly on criminal law here. So guilt phase. And for the scientists and, and uh, medicine side in the, the room, not all countries, but the United States bifurcates our criminal justice system. The fact finder, so usually the jury, or if it's a bench trial, the judge, determines whether or not guilty or not guilty. And then typically in our system, the judge, though in some capital cases, if it's a death penalty, a jury, decides the sentence. At the guilt phase, we've seen versions of my brain made me do it, or my brain tamer, uh, tumor made me do it. Did my neurons make me do it? I will say that there is an argument called hard determinism from neuroscience, which goes like this and hasn't had much purchase in the justice system, which would say it's not that my brain tumor made me do it, it's that my brain made me do it. And your brain made you do everything you do. And in fact, our brains are physically uh, determined what we do, and there is no free will, there is no free choice. And if I drop this watch, no one would say that the watch chose to land there. Indeed, if I gave one of you the, the pro we had the properties, the requisite uh, uh, weight of the watch, the air resistance, et cetera, you could predict exactly where that watch would land. It had no choice. And are we as humans just the same? There are many neuroscientists who think a version of that, and they have called for re recalibrating the criminal justice system to do away with from moral culpability altogether and focus just on utilitarianism, a consequentialist approach, treating humans like the way you would treat broken brakes. That is, you don't say if your brakes on your car go out, bad brakes, what are you thinking? But you also don't continue to drive your car. You take it to the car shop, and if they can't fix your brakes, you don't let that car back on. Robert Sapolsky, a neuroscientist at Stanford, has uh, made that case. Uh, that version of neuroscience and law, as you can imagine on the law side, has not had much traction. But other versions are starting to make some inroads and are at least for discussion. So here's a, an example. This is Herbert Weinstein. Herbert Weinstein, 67-year-old advertising executive in New York City. No criminal history and one day comes home in 1991, strangles his wife and throws her out of their 13-story apartment building in New York to make it look like a suicide. And he doesn't contest these facts at all. At his guilt phase, murder trial, he wants to plead an insanity defense. And he wants to argue that he had, could not appreciate right from wrong. And he's certainly allowed to make that argument. In our justice system, people have been making that argument sometimes like this many, many, you know, many times. What was new about this case is that to support his argument, he wanted to introduce these images. There's an MRI image and something called a positron uh, uh, tomography uh, image where um, uh, pet image on the right where what they're trying to do is argue that this, you can kind of see if I got the, um, there, there it is. Uh, here, a big cyst in the frontal lobe, an arachnoid cyst, growing, killing a lot of brain cells in this area. The 
frontal lobes, they argued, his defense team argued, is a place in the brain that helps with executive function, planning, moral decision making. It was damaged and therefore we should at least let the jury see this. Right? We should at least let the jury see this and the judge, as playing the gatekeeper role of evidence, had to decide, do I allow this before a jury, these images? Right? The argument on the other side, it could be prejudicial. The main substantive argument is that we have zero research then and we have zero research now about the relationship between this particular brain abnormality and this violent behavior. That is, we don't know how many people are walking around with brains that look like this who are not strangling their wives and throwing them out 13 story buildings. Questions like this are arising. In this particular case, I'll tell you, the judge split the baby. Uh, judge Gruthers decided to admit the image, allow the image to be presented, but not with testimony about causation, a causal link between this image uh, and the violent behavior. And we're seeing a lot of questions like that, and, and you know, with different results. What about the sentencing phase? Uh, we're also seeing a lot of use, and act factually more use, on the sentencing phase. It makes more sense at sentencing because you don't have to get into these deep questions about these causal relationships. You simply say, you know what, at sentencing, judge, you consider so many different factors already. You may consider a letter from a high school teacher. You may consider the way that the demeanor of them. You consider all this stuff. So you have a, uh, as one of my colleagues says, at trial, the scientific bar has to be good. You have to have good science. At sentencing, it just has to be good enough, right? And so the bar is a little bit lower. The considerations are a little bit different. Uh, is it having some effect? And the answer is it, it, it might. I'm going to show you one example actually where it wasn't a judge but a jury that was making a uh, decision and that was a death penalty case involving this individual, uh, Grady Nelson. Grady Nelson uh, is a case out of 2010 in Florida. Did a series of horrible things, uh, most notably stabbed his wife 70 times and killed her, attempted to stab and kill his stepchildren and had a litany of other crimes including sex assault. And there was no question that he was either, that he was guilty. It wasn't a guilt phase issue. The question was, because Florida's a death penalty state, will he do life without the, possibility, without the possibility of parole, or will he get the death penalty? And as part of his defense, his attorney, Terry Lenneman, got an expert, Robert Thatcher, to introduce this, quanta, quantitative electroencephalography. Big word. Their argument was that, based on electrical readings off the scalp, we have evidence consistent with our other arguments based on behavioral data, and this was the language of the lawyer, not the, not the expert. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client has a broken brain. It doesn't excuse his actions, but it explains them. Well, that jury split 6-6 after hearing this evidence, and three of the jurors afterwards spoke to the media. Jurors don't have to speak to the newspapers. Usually they don't, but sometimes they do. And this kind of gets to the question, well, does any of this stuff really matter? I mean, can brain imaging and, and should it doesn't make a difference? I'll just read you their quotes. Uh, and let it sink in. Juror Dolores Cannon, a hospital secretary, quote, when the brain evidence came in, the facts about the QEEG, some of us changed our mind. Juror John Howard, airport fleet services worker, the QEEG evidence turned my decision all the way around. The technology really swayed me. After seeing the brain scans, I was convinced this guy had some sort of brain problem. Now, they didn't all buy it. Juror Leon Benbo, retired mailman, I'm on record as saying I think that's the right, this is the right interpretation, but all that scientific testimony, that was a waste of taxpayer money. That's phony. There's nothing wrong with that guy's brain. So we don't know, but the point is that it's having an effect. If we had more time, I'd tell you about a series of Supreme Court cases. Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual cases where the Supreme Court has referenced to brain science and has fundamentally changed the way that we sentence juvenile offenders. If we had more time, I'd tell you about some innovative work looking at detection. Is someone really in pain? Pain detection? Stay tuned. What about memory? Can we detect memories? Stay tuned. What about the holy grail of neuroscience and law, lie detection? Well, there have actually been two cases where uh, fMRI-based lie detection has been offered, another with EEG-based memory recognition. Not enough time, but I just want to tantalize you by saying that it's out there. Um, and as I noted, there's a lot more than criminal law, a lot more we could talk about because a lot in law hinges on how brains work and because I spent a lot of time with it. Um, there's a whole world of sports concussions, for instance, as just one of those many other things. All right, so let's wrap up uh, with the future. About five minutes of discussion about addiction and the law. There are a lot of potential next chapters, but given today's uh, focus, I want to think about the addicted brain. This image comes from a New York Times editorial uh, from a few years ago trying to capture this notion of is an addicted brain a hijacked brain? You know, an open question. So in, addiction in the law is not a new issue for law. This is from 1962, which by the way, it's around that time where our leading Supreme Court cases 
uh, on addiction and law still, still rest. We've had to rest with it for a long time. And I think neuroscience addiction and, and law really invites um, four different possibilities. The first two are less controversial. The, the last two that I'll talk about are more challenging. So the first is simply that engaging with any population, whether it be those with bipolar disorder or substance use disorder, you name it, better understanding of why it is they do the things they do at a personal level or a systemic level is probably a good thing. This we know interpersonally if we have someone with a certain mental disorder, maybe we even tell our children at Thanksgiving before they go, you know, so and so may say these things, but don't worry, this is why. If we have a better understanding when someone comes into our office or if they come repeatedly, why do you keep doing these things again and again? Maybe we simply have a better understanding. And I think we should all agree to that. Secondly, treatment, I'm going to save most of those for the experts who are to follow, but I think there's probably consensus that if, and this is the big if, we can identify the correct or the most appropriate or most likely effective treatments and another big if, we have the resources to implement them, we ought to do that. All right? That's, I think, it's challenging because those treatments aren't clear and lining them up with individuals isn't clear, but um, there's, I think, probably and hopefully a consensus in this room that that's an opportunity. Let me talk about two specific legal questions that are more challenging and more controversial. So the lawyers in the room will understand what a sentencing departure is. Um, the non-lawyers may not, so let me just give this 30-second uh, background. When a judge comes, has a, crim a convicted uh, offender in front of them and has to decide, what am I going to sentence this individual to? In today's modern system, especially in the federal system and most state systems, certainly here in Virginia, they don't just pick a number or a set of uh, sentencing uh, options out of thin air. They are provided guidelines. There's been a lot of debate historically about how stringent, how much room you should give judges, how much leeway should they have. The general arguments toward more leeway is that you can have more individualized justice. The general argument toward more st stringent guidelines is that it avoids some of the variance and the bias and the potential injustice from treating one person differently than another. Let's set that aside. The question that neuroscience raises, or one of them, is how addiction should be treated as a departure. That is, you can go upward for departure. If something, if a certain set of facts is really bad, maybe this person should be punished more. If there are a bunch of mitigating, not aggravating, mitigating circumstances, maybe we should do something less. There's one federal judge, he just retired from the bench actually, whose version, I'll just give this to you as a thought, um, Judge Bennett out of Iowa, who based on neuroscience, this is his uh, Hendrickson opinion from a few years ago, in his view, there should be essentially a default automatic departure down for anyone with a substance use disorder. Uh, his argument is that because uh, addiction is a serious brain disease that diminishes one's capacity to evaluate decisions, regulate behavior, I consider addiction to be a generally and substantially mitigating factor under that's the relevant uh, statutory reference, weighing in favor of a downward variance. That's a pretty controversial op opinion, um, but it's at least a possibility, right? And again, this is not, what if a judge thought of this? What if a judge thought of branches? This is an actual published opinion, and there are others who have countered the point, but the point is that one way that you might think about neuroscience and law is that any time a defendant is there with that identified addiction, automatic downward departure. Possibility, and there are arguments against that as well. And then I want to leave you with um, a thought uh, about doctrinal change. In general, in the criminal law, explanation is not excuse. Explanation is not excuse, even a really good one. So why did you steal two loaves of bread because your kids are starving? Great explanation, not a very good excuse. You are still guilty. You've got the requisite mental state, the mens rea, and the relevant actus reus. For most addicts, there's, you know, why did they break into a house and steal the opioids? Why did they do X, Y, and Z? Pretty good explanation, which you're going to hear in great detail, exquisite detail about the way that they value time, the way that their brain circuits are working. Great explanation in science and medicine. It's not going to do you much good in terms of excuse, justifying excuse. You don't get to get you're not guilty. But there are some who are pressing up against this, and again, whether it's worthwhile, uh, whether it's going to have legs, I don't know, but I want to just raise the point. This is a case that made waves last year in the state of Massachusetts. This is a picture of Julie Eldred. Like many here in Virginia, Julie Eldred, addicted to opioids, found guilty of her drug offense and went on probation. And of course, all the probation officers here will tell us that, you know, probably condition number one is you have to stay drug free. 
She relapsed in three days. And she argued, and this went up to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, that I did not choose to relapse. My brain, using brain terms, was hijacked. I didn't have a choice. And therefore, it is unconstitutional under the Massachusetts State Constitution to require me to remain drug-free because I didn't have a choice. That was her argument. Now, there were amicus briefs on the science on both sides. Right? I think there's good reason to argue on, on both sides. I, mean, I, get, I get what she was arguing for. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court did not find in her favor for a variety of reasons. But again, the argument is made, and it's out there. Um, it's getting more, more challenging and controversial. So you know, where the future goes, uh, specifically on addiction neuroscience and law, more broadly on neuroscience and law, are really open and fluid questions right now. Uh, but it's great that you're having uh, this conversation. And as I said before, if nothing else, if nothing else, I hope that our collective sense of understanding would lead to greater empathy uh, and engagement with a variety of, of those who are in the criminal justice system, including those uh, challenged by substance use disorder. I think I'll stop there, and I don't know if we have enough time for questions. We're running a little late, but leave it there. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. Dr. Yes, Shen? sir. I may not be understanding this correctly, uh, so just bear with me. Are you saying that the what you're able to um, show with the imaging, these processes that are going on within the brain, are you saying that those processes are physical evidence of moral decision making? Well, yes and no. Um, certainly. Uh, moral decision making and all decision making is this some as of yet not fully understood uh, set of computational circuitry in the brain. Um, so in that sense, yes. In the sense that there's evidence right now that someone can point to and say, I have a brain scan that shows the way that I am able to pro that I processed my moral decision on Tuesday, January 12th at 2.59 at the alleged time of my crime, no way. Now, I think there's this middle ground, which you're about to hear, and I'll just raise it for the group. When you hear information about, in general, that individuals are, every time they make a decision under cert, while under certain substance use, are discounting their decision making. Whether or not that's legally relevant is a, is a completely different question. And it may not be legal, legally relevant at all. Indeed, you know, one of this point about explanation not being excuse, at present, it's not legally relevant at all in terms of whether or not uh, there's a guilty or not guilty verdict. It may or may not be more relevant in trying to think about, now that you're guilty and you're in our justice system as an offender, what's the best thing we can do so that you don't come back in here you know, in a year or six months or, or nine months? So, um, I, reasoning from a completely naturalistic premise. Our law does not reason from a completely naturalistic premise. And, and what you're arguing for, in essence, would gut the idea that we have moral agency. So the question is, does neuroscience gut the question that there's moral agency? Um, I'm not suggesting that. But there are many in neuroscience who would say absolutely yes. That the entire idea that we are moral beings in the sense that I think you're suggesting, that we make these conscious decisions about right and wrong, that's a fallacy. Now, I'm not in that group, but there are many extremely smart neuroscientists who think that that's, that's correct. And not surprisingly, that view of neuroscience has not made large impact on law because you're right. Law and I think probably the bulk of the populace uh, views moral decision making differently. Now that said, uh, it is really important to note that our moral decision making machinery, and you know, Dr. Mani could talk about you know a, a variety of other work in this field, is um, is get, is headed towards you know uh, trying to uncover how it is that um, that we make a variety of decisions, including you know which candidate to vote for or um, you know, whether or not to choose one color over another in marketing or, or you name it. But you're right, there's a, there is a tension uh, uh, in sort of some views of 
um, how decision making is, is approached in science and law, and that's one of the challenges of navigating the intersection. Other questions for Dr. Shen? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, um, I have a question. A comment and then a question. So um, I don't know if everybody in this room knows, but Virginia only this year has a properly funded uh, lawyer uh, addiction network. Previously, we just worked on a shoestring. So it's only this year that every lawyer is being assessed 30 bucks to help with addiction issues. So, you know, in terms of how far along are we in treating addiction, you just have to look at how we treat lawyers and we get some understanding of that. And then the other, the other question is, um, in my neck of the woods up in Lynchburg, we have a whole network of local jails. And you have people there who stay for a year even. And there's no, you know, there's no treatment protocol at all. You have guys who are sitting there who are dealing meth, using meth, going to end up in the criminal system for a very long time if they don't get some help. And there's no, you know, there's no help. So the question, I guess, is um, what's y'all's perspective on our responsibility uh, to these folks that we are incarcerating in our local jails? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I mean, the question of resource constraints probably goes beyond the, uh, the science. Um, I mean, I, I think my general response would be, as available, um, it makes sense to try and uh, invest in those resources. I think it's always difficult to make the case in this and in a number of other areas um, for preventative interventions that will save money over time, but on a particular budget line will show a, a spike a relative to many other competing legislative uh, and policy priorities. Uh, and I will say that, I mean, I, we can see what our treatment uh, folks will say next, um, but as best I know, there is not you know, a simple magic solution, which means that when you say treatment, treatment does, and, and I mean, this gets to the challenges of the brain, it goes back to your question about the complexities of moral decision making. Interventions to modify decision making architecture in the brain are not always as simple as drug, or electrical stimulation, and certainly not surgery. An intervention could be a new job. An intervention could be connecting to the proper social network. An intervention could be engaging with the proper counselor who's doing cognitive behavioral therapy. And this goes to your resource question. Those resources, those sorts of interventions, can often be more expensive than, boy, if we just had this drug that we're gonna you know, intervene. And of course, those can work in conjunction. So maybe there is medicalization and, uh, and social intervention, but uh, but the resource constraints are real and, um, and a real challenge. Okay, I think we need to move on to the next session. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Shen. Thank you.